1984, IBM released the PC Junior as a low-cost variant of the IBM PC. The PC Junior was intended for the home market and tried to compete with Apple II and the Commodore 64. Despite widespread anticipation, the PC Junior was ultimately unsuccessful in the market. I disagree with the market, so I have one and I'm making videos about it. But not today. Today our attention goes to IBM's next attempt to sell home computers. After just one year, IBM dropped the PC Junior and left the home market for the next five years. In 1990, IBM returned with the PS1 line of computers. In a way, these machines are sort of clones of IBM clones. It's weird, but IBM tried to innovate forward with the PS2 line, while every other PC manufacturer just kept making faster and better clones. And IBM eventually gave up and ended up making IBM-compatible IBMs. I'm still missing a few parts for my early PS1, but eventually there will be a video on this channel about this machine too. Early PS1s had some weird but interesting things about them, but this late PS1 is pretty much a clone with an IBM badge. In this video we are going to restore this IBM and set it up for some good old DOS gaming. And if it's anything like my other PS1 486SX, we will also hack the motherboard to take a much faster 486DX. By the way, if you like this type of content, let me know with a thumbs up. This PC has been upgraded with a Creative Sound Blaster CD-ROM drive, and probably the matching Sound Blaster inside. This is a period correct upgrade, so that's perfectly normal, and very lucky for me. The funny thing is that it came from a local church. So I guess the priest was enjoying some DOS gaming when he wasn't preaching. These PS1s were sold with a fragile but very nice to type on Model M2. It's a very lightweight buckling spring keyboard, and it's the third best keyboard I have ever used. That being said, don't rush off to buy one, unless you're willing to repair it. These keyboards are incredibly fragile. I once dropped one of the keycaps on the floor, and the damn thing broke in pieces. And still, I like it so much, it's worth the hassle. Just be very careful with it, and whatever you do, don't ever drop it. I have repaired this keyboard three times so far. The matching display is a very decent PS1 branded 14 inch SVGA. On the front panel of this PS1 it has what looks like a volume knob and it's stuck. The label says 2168-552, 486SX25, 4 megs of RAM and a 129 meg hard drive. At the back the power supply has been smashed, and the grill seems to be pushed into the fan. Underneath it has some kind of a security mount. The priest seems to have had this IBM bolted to the desk. I guess he was afraid that someone would snatch his gaming rig. The cover of the case seems to be held in place with these two screws on top of the machine. I tried to slide the cover off but it seems really stuck. So let's try with a soft prying tool. Yeah, this cover is really stuck. But I think it's unstuck now. Okay, let's try again. By the way, it probably doesn't show up on camera, but this case is very filthy. And before we continue this restoration, I would like to thank the sponsor of this video, PCBWay. Aside from making excellent PCBs, they also do CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing and injection molding. Check out their shared projects page, where you will find some really cool projects for your vintage PC. Get an instant quote now at PCBWay.com. Thank you PCBWay for supporting this channel. And as so often with IBMs, this thing is very bulky and it has the look and feel of an industrial machine, more than a PC. That case is probably twice as thick as any other PC I have worked on from the era. On top of the case there is an empty slot here for a hard drive. And looking from the side here, 
it has a very dusty power supply. On top here it has a diskette drive that has been disconnected. And then the CD-ROM drive of course. And down here we have a hard drive. So I guess we'll start at the top. And being an IBM it's put together with bolt head screws. And the CD-ROM drive is held in place with regular screws. So it's definitely not installed by IBM. So let's see what this mystery drive is. And we're in luck, so this is not a modern upgrade. It's a period correct Matsushita CR563B. It's dated June 1993. And according to an old thread on Vogons, it's a 2x Matsushita Panasonic drive. So this is no regular IDE drive. We're off to a good start here. The hard drive is held in place with bolt head screws. So hopefully this is the original drive. And hopefully it still works. At least the screws are probably original. And it's a Connor drive. CFS541A. So unfortunately not the original drive. But at least it's a period correct Connor drive. And the label looks like it's from IBM. So probably a dealer upgrade. And I guess this size is a bit more suitable for DOS gaming. Okay, let's see if we can remove these covers. And that was easy, and it didn't even break. And the plastics haven't yellowed. So that's a nice bonus. And apparently this was made out of two pieces. And the stuck pot is mounted in the chassis. Uh, now it actually started to move, so it wasn't stuck that badly. We might as well remove it right away. And the knob is in the matching IBM blue. Nice touch. And for some reason it has already been disconnected from the motherboard. But then the cable continues down to the speaker down here. So this volume knob is for the built-in speaker. And I guess it was disconnected because of that sound blaster. Uh, we might as well remove that speaker right away. I realize it's hard to see on camera. But hopefully from this angle you can see that the power supply has been smashed. And the power supply has standard connectors. So no weird stuff like in the PS2 line. So I can see a coin cell. So no leaky battery in this machine. And the ribbon cable for the CD-ROM is attached to the sound card. So what I read on that Vogons thread seems to be correct. Okay, let's see what this very dusty sound card is. So this is one of the earlier Sound Blaster 16 cards with the real OPL3 chip. And I'm pretty sure this is the matching card for that CD-ROM drive. We'll have a close look at it on the bench in a minute. Okay, let's see if we can rescue this power supply. And it seems to be put together with just two screws. Oh man, that is disgusting. That's just completely filled with nasty dust. So I'm gonna have to do some cleaning here. So I think someone dropped this PC with this side facing down. And I guess that's a good thing, because if it had been dropped with the other side facing down, the entire front panel would probably have been smashed. Okay, let's see if we can get that PCB out. Hmm, that's weird. It's using different types of screws to hold this PCB down. So I'm gonna have to keep track of what screw goes where. Okay, let's see if we can get this grommet out. And the usual disclaimer applies. Don't poke around inside power supplies without proper training. The caps inside may not have been discharged and may contain high voltages. And we're gonna have to snip these cable ties and later replace them to get that PCB out. And one of the cables doesn't have connectors, how annoying. 
So this is as far as we can get inside. But I think it's enough to clean it and to repair that case. And the PCB is held in place with this tiny little plastic clip that is stuck inside the fan. In case you find one of these on the floor after having serviced one of these power supplies. And the fan has been bent in place with these tabs. So let's see if we can bend them up. Yeah, that was easy enough. And then we have a smaller PCB on the side here. Okay, that should be enough. Now let's see if we can bend this piece back to shape. So let's just use some good old brute force. And I think it was as easy as that. Okay, so I spent about a minute and I'd say that's good enough for me. And now the fan can spin freely again. And when I was cleaning, I noticed that the fan took a hit too. So I'm not sure if the camera will pick this up. But it's bent out of shape. It still turns freely and it doesn't make any noises. But I really like what I'm seeing so far in this project. So I think I'm going to use this machine quite a lot for DOS gaming. So we might as well replace it with a Noctua fan. Okay, and the CD-ROM cleaned up nicely too. And the belt looks fine. Unfortunately, I'm not sure about the date codes on these chips. But what I think is the date code on this Logic chip here says 311. So I guess that's week 11 of 1993. And then we have the diskette drive. And it has IBM part numbers. And this IC has a date code of week 29 of 1993. So this is probably the original drive. And I noticed something interesting here. The head on this drive has a damper. So have a look at that head when I push the diskette in. That's a pretty fancy feature. Uh, this drive was filled with dust. But as you can see it cleaned up nicely. Uh, next up we have the piece to resistance. So underneath that thick layer of dust. I found this very nice and clean Sound Blaster 16. CT1740. And it's in perfect condition. And the date codes are from week 23, 1993. So I haven't checked the dates on the motherboard yet. But I think this card was installed when the machine was new. So this could possibly be a dealer upgrade. And I didn't know that this card was in the machine when I bought it. A very long time ago. Okay, so these are pretty fun boards to hack. But let's start with the simple stuff first. So up here we have sockets for cash. And we're gonna fill them up for sure. And these two RAM slots can either take FPM or EDU sticks. There are pads to solder in two more slots. Or you can just solder in RAM chips directly on these four pads here. The required caps are already soldered to the board. The board only has ISA slots, but that doesn't really matter because this board already has local bus graphics. So there's no real reason to upgrade anyways. It's plenty fast for DOS adventure games already. I think this motherboard was probably designed for a desktop. And then they just decided to use it in a tower. And made this crazy contraption here. And this is just a custom PCB stuck into this slot. If you want to mess around with windows in high resolution mode, you can upgrade VRAM in this zip socket here. And on my other board I have soldered 512k RAM chip on these pads here. So that board has 1 meg of VRAM already. And thanks to the generosity of your tab mode, I have a few of these chips that will fit that zip socket. So we'll try these out today. 
and these came in a large donation that he did quite a while back. And now to the most interesting bits on this board. This socket here is for a 487 Mathco. However, the 487 Mathco is just a regular 486DX with an extra pin tucked into this corner here. And that extra pin disables the onboard SX25. So after we have done some tests, we are going to bridge two pins on this socket and use it with a regular DX. This is an ODP100 by the way. And it has a really badly bent pin. So perhaps we should try this sucker out on this board. This ODP has been sitting on a shelf since forever because it has that bent pin. But I recently watched one of Big Bad Biologist's live streams where he straightened up a whole bunch of pins on the chip. So I think we need to try that too and see if this ODP works on this motherboard. The original BIOS on these boards can't handle the level 1 cache on a regular ODPR. But thanks to Major Tom, we have a hacked BIOS for this project. And it will be really interesting to know if that BIOS can handle the level 1 cache of the ODP. So let's hope we can fix that pin. There is only one thing that we haven't been able to figure out about these boards. And that is if it's possible to make them run faster. So if you have any thoughts on how to hack the speed, please let us know. Okay, but before we start upgrading and hacking, let's just replace that coin cell and just do a quick test. And just make sure that this board runs. I did a quick test when I bought this machine years ago. And as far as I remember, it was a working board. Okay, all bodged together. Uh, we've got a couple of errors. And I guess that's the battery. And yes. Okay, 486SX, no math co. BIOS date from 1993. And we forgot to check the dates on that motherboard. We've got 8 megs of RAM. Internal cache 8K. Zero external cache. So the board seems to be working. So let's start with that bent pin. Okay, so certainly not an easy thing to get on camera. But check out this pin here. So I think that someone tried to force this chip into a socket that doesn't have that extra hole. So I'm going to try with a desoldering tool that I don't really know the name of. But it's hollow stainless needles. I'll put it on top of the pin and then I'm gently going to pry and this pin has been bent twice in two different directions so I'm gonna have to bend it this way first and I think I'm gonna have to do the rest of camera because this is too difficult to see well, at least I can show you my progress. So I managed to lift this lower part that was bent in this direction. So that very first piece is now straight. And now I need to bend this upper piece here to the left. Well, it sure isn't pretty. But it looks pretty damn good compared to what it did. So hopefully you can see, it's not perfectly straight, but it looks quite alright. There are a few more pins that aren't perfectly straight, so I'm gonna have to take care of these too. But these should be much easier. And if you're looking for a tool to straighten up pins on a 486, try one of these stainless needles. This one fits perfectly and makes the job much easier. Well, those pins really aren't perfect, but this is worth a try. 
So let's first try with the ZIF socket. And this socket here has that extra hole. So this should be safe. And yeah, it fits this socket at least. Now the next problem is that the socket in our IBM is not a ZIF socket. Okay, let's see how lucky we are. Man, this is nerve-wracking. I hate these sockets. Well, I can't see anything bending. So I guess I'm gonna have to use a little bit more force. Okay, I think it went in. Now, I don't know if any of the pins got bent. But we're just gonna have to test and see if it works. And I don't even know if that ODP works on this board. Because I don't have proper documentation about this machine. There are a few manuals online for similar machines. But I have never seen a service manual for this board. Let's just try and see if it works. Okay, let's see how lucky we are. Well, it posts. So that's a good start. And we've got error 129. And that's the same error we had with the ODP. It doesn't recognize all that level 1 cache. And in the BIOS it has disabled the internal cache entirely. Well, let's try to enable it and see what happens. No, we got the same error again. Well, at least we don't need to make that bodge wire. So then we know you can in fact use an ODP on this board without budging the board. But the bio still doesn't recognize all that level 1 cache. Well, luckily we have a hacked BIOS from Major Tom. So that would be the next thing to test. Well, I'm pretty sure these boards are identical. Well, I guess we could compare the part numbers on the BIOS chip. Well, those labels are pretty washed out, so you probably can't see it on camera. But they are using the same BIOS, 65G9498. And they were actually manufactured with just one week in between. And the manufacturing date of our tower here is 14th of November of 1993. So this should definitely work. Let's put some Dioxid Magic in that single wipe socket. And Tom's hacked BIOS. And like magic, the error is gone. And unfortunately, our IBM just decided to die. We've got a black screen. Let's check that fuse first. No, fuse is fine. So how about the voltages? Absolutely nothing. That power supply is dead as a doornail. Seriously, what are the odds? I had to repair the power supply in my other PS1 486SX25 twice. And now this damn thing is dead. Crap. Okay, and I reconnected the power supply to the board. And now it's working again. So perhaps that power supply got too hot. Because I just have the fan outside of the power supply. So hopefully that was our problem. We better turn that off. And I guess I'll put that fan inside the power supply. Until my new fan arrives. So we can do some more tests. And I'll replace it later when I have a new fan. Well, I decided to bodge it because I don't want to take that damn thing apart again tomorrow when I have a new fan. So I'll put the fan inside and I'll just put something on top. And hopefully the airflow will go past all the components and keep it cool enough. Uh, and apparently that didn't work. So yeah, that fan is smashed. So the blades are touching the case back here. Let's try again. 
Ah, uh, no, I can hear that fan trying to start. Well, as long as the fan is outside of the case, it seems to be working, so I'll just put something on top here. Uh, we'll hope for the best. Okay, so let's move on to the VRAM. So our Sirius Logic GD5424 has 512K. Let's add that zip chip. And I actually have these zip sockets in quite a few PS2s. But I have never used these chips. They are a bit funny looking. We still have 512K. There is no markings for pin 1 on that socket. So let's try to turn it around. And I hope we didn't kill that chip. Well, good news and bad news. I found the service manual, but unfortunately it didn't mention pin 1 for the zip socket. So I grabbed another chip and put it in the other way around, but it still wouldn't work. So unfortunately these are probably not the right modules for this board. Okay, it's the next day and the new fan has arrived and I found a chip so we can add some more VRAM directly to the board. Now let's fix that fan. So this is a Noctua Redux NFR8 and it should fit this power supply. Now let's make sure we get it in the right direction. So it should blow the air out from the power supply. And I did some thinking last night. That ODP we used is the only 486 I have with that extra pin. And it's quite handy to keep for testing things out. And since we have the board out, we might as well do the hack. And just use a regular DX4. And unfortunately there isn't enough room for this larger connector. So I'm gonna have to swap the connector on our new fan. But hopefully they are using identical pins. And we're in luck. They seem to be identical. And mining the polarity these should just snap right in and lock in place. Perfect. And uh, that yellow wire is going to touch the leg of a resistor. So I'm gonna snip it off. And sure enough it fits perfectly now. Well that looks good enough to me. Okay, power supply put back together. Let's see if it still works. And it does. But now it's whisper quiet. But there's definitely air blowing out of that fan. Unfortunately time is running out for this week. But if you're watching this video a week from now, there will be a link to part 2 below where we finish this project. And if not, you can use the bell icon below and set it to all. That way YouTube will notify you when it's done and uploaded. In part 2 we are going to solder the VRAM chip directly to the board, make the bodge and disable the SX25, and add the rest of the upgrades. We are also going to do a factory restore with the bundled MS-DOS and Windows. And finally we are going to try this epic IBM with some DOS gaming. If you haven't watched my previous restoration of the original Macintosh, this is a good time to catch up. I would like to end this video by saying thank you to my very first patrons. Your support means a lot to me. If you want to become an early supporter of this channel too, you can use the link below this video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.